Experience Life. How are we? Good to see you here at our Southwest campus. I want to welcome all of you watching via video at our downtown campus. Glad you guys are here today. Amarillo campus, Church Online, one of our network churches throughout West Texas. Just want to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us uh, today. This is part two, a series we started last weekend called When Life Falls Apart. And basically what we did last weekend was I said, I want to do this series where I just share with you some of what happened to me this summer. If you weren't here last week, and again, you can check out the message online, but I shared that story of getting a cyst on the back of my throat and the surgery and just the recovery process and all of that. So I wanted to share that with you and then also share with you some of the things that the Lord taught us during this time of suffering for our family, me specifically, but it was definitely a rough, miserable summer uh, for sure. Won't go into all the details of the story again. Uh, you can pick those up online if you, if you missed the message. But uh, last week, and we just spent some time talking about suffering because we all go through that. We all have times in our life where we feel like our lives are falling apart. And one of the kind of big ideas from last weekend was simply this, that suffering draws you closer to Jesus than you would have been without it. Like when your life falls apart, that can draw you closer to Jesus than you would have been had that not happened. And so that's why Peter said in the text we looked at, Last week in 1 Peter chapter 4, he said, so you can be very glad when these trials come because of what it does for your relationship with God and how it can draw you so close. So that's kind of a summary of what we talked about last week. But I just wanted to continue with that this weekend and basically start off by saying this. One of the greatest temptations when we begin to suffer or go through difficult times or when we feel like our life is falling apart, one of the greatest temptations we face is to begin to fear right? To become afraid. It's a temptation when you're suffering to start fearing what's going to happen next. And so this looks different for everybody, but let's say you were in a relationship for a long time and ended up in a big breakup, then maybe you were afraid that you would get into a good relationship, whether or not you'd be able to get in a good relationship that would, you know, lead to marriage and ultimately be somebody you could spend the rest of your life with. You just got afraid because you went through this big breakup. Or maybe you were married and you got a divorce and you were afraid of being alone, you really feared that. You didn't know how that was going to look. Maybe you lost your job and you be became afraid that you might not find another one. Or you started struggling to pay the bills and you, you began to fear that you might not be able to provide for your family and keep a roof over your heads. Maybe it was something with your health. Your health just went, you know, spiraled downward. And you just started to fear, hey, what's the prognosis going to be? What's going to happen to me? Am I going to make it? Do I have some incurable disease? What, what's wrong with me? And you began to become afraid. That's just a temptation that we all face when our lives start to fall apart. We start to become afraid. Now I want you to think about something, and then I'm going to launch into this text here that I think is so powerful. I think I could easily argue that we're all afraid of something. Question for you today, you don't have to say it out loud, but just in your own heart. I want to ask you, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Now, I'm not talking about like snakes or spiders or something like that. I, I would get that. I hate snakes, all right? I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about something that you face on a regular basis. Hopefully, you don't have snakes chasing you around on a regular basis. But what, what, what honestly, what are you afraid of? Think about it. What are you afraid of? I want to spend a minute allowing God's word to argue with us about our fears. This is a powerful text of scripture I want you to turn to in Isaiah chapter 41, Isaiah 41. If you're in the blue ones, you'll be looking all day long because this is a New Testament and Isaiah is in the Old Testament. You're like, Isaiah, that's a cool name. Is that a book? That's a book of the Bible. It's in the Old Testament, not the New Testament. So if you got one of these, then just set it down, I guess, and pull out your smartphone. If you got a smartphone as opposed to a, a dumb phone, I guess, or whatever the opposite of that is, like one that has apps, all right, you can get a Bible on there and go to the Old Testament, Isaiah. But if you want a New Testament, easy to understand translation, we pass these out at all of our campuses. Welcome to pick one up on your way out. Isaiah 41, God's people, God's talking to his people, the Israelites, and at this time they're afraid. And so God has something he wants to say to them. Many of them could say, hey, God, we feel like our lives are falling apart, and as a result, we're starting to fear, and then God speaks into this situation. I just want you to know that this text of Scripture has totally changed the way I view difficult circumstances in my life. And if you're going through a difficult time right now, this text of scripture could totally set you free. It's so powerful and so reassuring. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. You'll have it memorized before you leave here because it's not very hard. And I'm going to break it down into a couple of parts here. But this is what it says. God speaking to his people. They're afraid. 
So you can imagine us being in the same, you know, same situation. We're afraid, going through something tough in our lives. This is what he says. Don't be what? Afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, your translation might say, fear not. Thou shalt not fear. You know, something along those lines. Don't, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Did you know? Watch this. This is the most frequently repeated command in all of the Bible. Did you know that? Over and over and over and over and over again, hundreds of times, God says what? Don't be afraid. Why do you think that is? Because we have a tendency to be what? Afraid. We have a tendency to fear. And so God over and over again says, hey, here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you're a follower of me, you don't need to be afraid. Like, there's nothing to be afraid of. One of the ways you know, though, you're becoming afraid, you're struggling with fear, is you start to ask a question. It's a very destructive question. It's a dangerous question. Let me show you the question you start to ask when you become afraid. You're familiar with this question, right? Anybody besides me ever asked this question before? What if? Like, what if, God, what if I don't find the one? God, what if I can't pay my bills? God, what if because of my health, what if I don't make it? What if I don't have much time left to live? God, what if things just continue to go bad for me? Like, God, what if, what if, what if? It's a question that's rooted in and based on fear being afraid. And I, I mean, if I had to be honest with you, this summer, when I felt like, like I told you last week, I was choking to death, I was afraid, and I asked some of these questions. I'm like, what if, God, what if, I'm thinking this to myself, and it stresses you out, what if I choke to death? God, what if they do surgery, and the surgery doesn't work out all that well? Like, what if I have trouble speaking again? Like, what if this cyst that they take out, and they send to pathology, what if it's cancerous? Like, what if, God? What if? struggle with that. I've asked those questions, and it seems like if you ask one, you're going to ask two, and if you ask two, you're going to ask three and four, and it keeps on going and going and going. You know what this question leads to? That's rooted in fear. Let me show you what it leads to. You know this, right? Stress, anxiety, depression. You think maybe that's why God says to his kids, don't be afraid, because it leads someplace he knows we don't want to end up, and he doesn't want us to end up fearing, asking this question all the time, ending up stressed out, anxious, and maybe even depressed. That's why he says, don't be afraid. You see this question, what if, and the fears as they keep building on each other, they don't lead anywhere good. They lead to stress, more stress, more anxiety, more depression. I guarantee I felt all of these in some measure this summer just because of the difficulties we were going through, but a lot of it was because I just kept saying, what if this, what if that, what if this, what if that? Leads nowhere you want to go. That's why God said, don't be afraid. Like I'm God, don't be afraid. Look at this. I like how the pastor, this pastor I was reading one time defined uh, fear. Take a look at this. He said this. You can write this down. He said, fear equals vision without hope. I like that. It's like fear equals, like I can see the future. Like I got a vision for my future, but here's the problem. It's hopeless. That's what fear says is I can see what's coming ahead. It's just not looking very good. That's what, that's what fear says. It's vision without hope. Now, I just, I want to take a poll, all right? Just take a poll, see if anybody's like me. How many of you guys would admit you're great at any, you know, in any given situation in your life at coming up with all the possible worst case scenarios? Anybody besides me? Come on, be honest. All of our campuses, all of our campuses, worst case scenarios. I'm the king of worst case scenarios, all right? So if you're going through a difficult time and you come to me and you ask me, hey, pastor, would you tell me my worst case scenarios? I'm a bad person to ask. Because we could talk all day. I could think about all kinds of different worst cases. Because that's what I do in my own life. You know, think of worst case scenarios. That's what, that's what fear does. You start processing through and rehearsing your mind all the worst case scenarios. Because you got vision, but it's without hope. An example would be, you go to the doctor for your you know, annual checkup or whatever. And you get a call a week later from the doctor. And the doctor leaves you a voicemail and just says to you, Hey, I need you to call my office immediately. What do you think to yourself? I got two weeks to live. I can't even believe this. I got cancer. I found cancer. Now I'm going to die. And this is my life's horrible. Now I have to tell my family. I wanted to get married first. And I'm not even ready for this. And God, I can't even believe you'd do this to me, whatever. So you call them back and you ask them, how much time do I have? And they're like, can I have your address? They just missing your address. You're like, see, why did I even, what? I thought I was going to die. And they just needed my address. What's going That's what we do, right? We just go through all these worst case scenarios. It doesn't help anything, but that's what fear causes you to do because you're thinking about the future, but you're thinking about how hopeless it could be, but probably won't be if you're really honest with yourself about all these worst case scenarios. Another thing fear does is it causes us to become false prophets. Really, right? 
because you start predicting futures that probably aren't going to happen, and then you cause yourself all kinds of stress, anxiety, and can send yourself into depression. We become false prophets. And I got to be honest, like every weekend, like can I be honest and confess my sin? Can, is, that, is that what we do that here? Okay, so um, every weekend I feel like it experience life before I get up to teach, I'll do some of the what ifs. I try not to, I resist those. I know that's based on fear. I shouldn't ask the what ifs, but I'll tell you, at least one time a weekend, because just, just so you know, in case you're just like, you just seem so comfortable up there. Right, okay, I'm an introvert, all right? So this is hard for me, I get nervous every week, and doesn't matter how many times I do it, how many years I do it, I get nervous. And so I'm usually getting ready to come up to speak, and I'll start going through some what ifs, and one of the what ifs that seems to come up over and over again, right before I get up to speak is this. God, what if, like, I'm doing this, I'm so nervous, what if I get up on stage and I just pass out? <laughs> You're laughing, I think that every week. And what if I pass out and they bring in a stretcher and they put them on there and then we need somebody to preach, so you like pick some of the audience, you, come on up here, you know, and he, he starts to preach and here I am, I'm rolling out here and I mean, and I'm thinking, God, wouldn't that be terrible if that habit just passed out on stage? It's probably gonna happen, I can't even believe that. Today I'm gonna pass out, when I get up there on stage, this is gonna be great in front of everybody. That's what we do, right? We become false prophets and we predict these futures that probably aren't gonna happen. I'm not saying that won't ever happen. And if I pass out, somebody come help me, please. But uh, I mean, it could happen. But you just start thinking through all these worst case scenarios, all these things that could happen, you become a false prophet because most of it is not gonna happen. You just stress yourself out, right? That's what we do, become false prophets. And Jesus decides he's gonna speak into all of this. New Testament, because he's dealing with folks that are worried and struggle with fear. So here's what Jesus says. You got to see this. This is great. This is so convicting to me, by the way. Just so you know, these last two weekends, I'm preaching to myself. If you get anything out of it, that's great, but I'm getting lots out of it. Okay. So this is for me. Matthew 6, 31 and following. Jesus says to some people like you and me struggling with this stuff. So don't what worry about these things saying, what are we going to eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things, watch this. They dominate the thoughts of unbelievers but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Jesus saying worries and fears and anxieties. It makes sense if they dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. That just makes sense, but it shouldn't dominate the thoughts of you and me if we're believers in Jesus because we have a heavenly father who already knows all of our needs. And I read that and I'm convicted because sometimes fears and anxieties can dominate my thoughts. How about you? But Jesus said, that shouldn't be the case. I'm your God. I'm here. Don't be afraid. And yet sometimes we act like unbelievers because we start fearing, become afraid, and it sends us into anxiety, panic, and depression. When Jesus is saying, you should know that the Father, he already knows your needs. There's nothing to be afraid of. So God says, Isaiah 41 don't be afraid. And you're like, well, here's the thing, God. That's like easier said than done, okay? I got a long list of reasons I'm afraid, all right? I got this reason and this reason. And so we're thinking, don't be afraid. Like, God, it's a command. I get that, but I, I think I should be afraid. God, with what I'm going through, anybody would be afraid. And here's what I love about this text is he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, don't be afraid, just good luck. He says, don't be afraid, and then he gives you and me a reason why we shouldn't be afraid. And to me, this is powerful. Let this sink in. Here's what he says, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Like there's nothing to be afraid of, even though you think there may be something to be afraid of, because what you're forgetting is I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm God, and in what you're going through, I'm going to be with you. All throughout the Bible, God would say this to people. They would be afraid, and he would just keep reassuring them, you don't have to be, because I'm with you over and over and over again. I'll give you some examples. Abraham. God tells Abraham, hey, you go to this land. I'm going to tell you where you're going later. I just want you to start going. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks because it's great faith that he even started going. He was probably afraid, and so God shows up to Abraham and says, Hey, Abraham, don't be afraid. I'm going to protect you. I'll be with you, and your reward will be great. 
His son, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac. Isaac's going through some difficult times. God says to Isaac, hey, Isaac, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm going to bless you. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, his son. Jacob has a brother. Esau wants to kill him. Jacob has a dream one night. God says to Jacob, hey, Jacob, I'm with you. I'm going to protect you wherever you go. Why does God say this over and over and over again? Don't be afraid I'm with you. Don't be afraid I'm with you. Don't be afraid I'm with you. Why does he say it over and over again? Because we have a tendency to forget, don't we? And we go through a difficult time. You know what we think? Man, God's abandoned me. God, I can't believe you do that. I'm, I feel like I've been abandoned by you. God, I feel like I'm going through this alone. I feel like I'm all alone, God, in this difficult time. Where are you? You feel abandoned by God, and I just want you to know, according to his word, that's a lie. That's a lie. Because once you commit your life to Christ, hear me say this, you will never be alone again. Don't claim to ever be alone, ever be abandoned by God. He's with you. He said it over and over and over and over again. Why don't I understand that? Why don't we understand that? Let's keep going. Moses, another example, supposed to go to the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, bring God's people out of Egypt and ultimately lead them toward the promised land. And he knows hey, Moses freaks out, argues with God about everything. And, he, and God says to Moses, hey, Moses, here's the thing. I know you're probably freaking out. I'm going to be with you. Like, you should go and not be afraid. Here's why. It's one only reason you really need. I'm going to be with you. David, you've heard this, Psalm 23, said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, like even though I'm going through a horrible time in my life right now, I will fear no evil because why? He said, you're with me, God. I'm going through the valley of a shadow of death. This is horrible. But God, I'm not going to be afraid because I really believe you're with me. Like David's probably thinking, things may not be okay, but I'm going to be okay because God's with me. Same is true for you if you're a follower of Jesus. Things may not be okay in your life right now, but you're going to be okay because God, he promises to be with you. Jeremiah, God says to Jeremiah, hey, don't be afraid of the people. I'm with you, and I'm going to protect you. Jesus, New Testament, great commission, right afterwards, he's saying, go make disciples and do all that. And then he says, be sure of this. What does he say? I'm going to be with you always, even until the end of the age, over and over and over again. I'm with you. I'm with you. Think about that. Like the God of the heavens and the earth is saying, I'm going to be with you in what you're going through. The God who created everything just spoke and things came into existence. He's saying, hey, I'm with you. The God who created man from the dust of the ground, I'm with you. The God who parted the Red Sea so that Moses and the Israelites could walk through on dry ground. He, that God, that same God, same God saying, I'm with you. God that told Joshua, hey, this Jericho this city, I'm going I'm to give you victory over. I just want you to march around, shout some, blow some trumpets. You don't have to fight. The walls are going to fall down. You're going to have victory. And it happened. That God is with you. The God that enabled a little boy named David with a sling and a stone to defeat a nine foot tall giant that everybody else was afraid of. That God is with you. The God who came and dwelt among us, New Testament, Jesus, raised the dead, healed the lame, healed the blind, cured the blind, cured people of diseases, walked on water, calmed raging storms. He himself was raised from the dead. That God He's with you. He's with me. So guess what that means? There's nothing to be afraid of. There's absolutely nothing that, sh that could come our way that we should be afraid of. If he's promising us, I'm with you. Like, he gets, we probably don't feel like we can handle the things coming our way. I can't always handle the stuff coming my way. You can't always handle the stuff coming your way. But God's saying, I can handle it, and I'm with you. And you know what's even cooler than that? What's even cooler than him being with us is you go New Testament. We're talking Old Testament. You go New Testament. It doesn't just say he's with us. The Bible also says he's what? He's in us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he resides in us to convict us, lead us, guide us, give us assurance of our salvation, and so on. He's not just with us. He's in us. There's nothing to be afraid of. I try to remind myself of this all the time. I want to read you a quote. This is uh, Brother Yun, quoted him last weekend, Chinese 
believer, persecuted, went through all kinds of suffering, tortured for his faith in China. He said this. Think about that. Think about this coming from some guy that's just suffering tremendously. He says, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then don't be afraid. The Prince of Peace lives in your heart, and you should not be scared of anything. If God is for you, no one and nothing can be against you. I swear I read that like three times a day when I was going through difficult times this summer. I'm just going to read it again just so that sinks in. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, picture a guy in, in prison being tortured or writing something like this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, don't be afraid. Him, he's probably trying to convince himself of this. I don't need to be afraid even with what I'm going through. The Prince of Peace lives in your heart. You should not be scared of anything. If God is for you, no one and nothing can be against you. I want every single one of you to hear that today. From God, him saying to you, word from God. It's not me saying it, it's God saying it. Don't be afraid if you're going through a relational issue. You got issues in your marriage. Something just happened. Don't be afraid, God said. I'm with you going through a difficult time financially. God's saying to you, word from God for you today, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Health issue. You're going through a health issue. Don't be afraid, God says. I'm with you. I'm with you. If you believe that promise, he will overwhelm you with his peace. And although what you're going through, I'm sure, will still remain difficult, you'll know he's with you to help you and give you endurance to make it through this difficult time. He floods you with his peace. Now, you ask, well, what does it mean that he's with me? Okay, so it's like presence is with me. Like, what, how, how does all that look? Let me, let me just keep reading in the Isaiah passage here. Why don't you see the rest of this? Because this is so good. So don't be afraid I'm with you. Then he keeps going. Don't be discouraged either. For I am your God. Not somebody else's God. He's talking to his people. He's saying, I'm your God. Like, we're in relationship. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up. With my victorious right hand. Now down to 13. For I hold you by your right hand, and I, the Lord your God, I, the Lord your God, and I say to you, don't be afraid. Watch this. I'm here to help you. Like the fact that he's with us means he can what? Help us. It's not just that he's with us, which is great, just in and of itself. His presence is with us. He can be with us when we go through difficult times. He's saying, I'm not just with you. The fact that I'm with you means I'm here to help you in whatever you're going through. I can help. I'm God. <laughs> I can do anything. That's why when we go through difficult times, it's so important that we run to God rather than from God. Got an email from a guy this last week, and he said, Pastor, I was there last weekend, and I needed to hear that message. He said, I've went through a time of intense suffering recently, and I ran from God, thinking that would help. Did he find that it helped? He said, it didn't help. I thought, I, I thought it'd help. That's why sometimes we run from God. We think, that's going to happen. I'm going to run from God. I'm so mad at God. can't believe God will let that happen. Remember, run from God as if there's help there, as if that's a solution. He found it wasn't. And he said, I needed to hear that. He said, because I recognize if I need help, I need to run to God. And he said, so I'm choosing to run to him today. We need him. He's with us. And when we go through difficult times, like what I went through this summer, what I loved reading and remembering is this promise. That the fact that he's with me meant that he'd help me. It may be hard, but he'd help. I'll let him. There's some of you here today at all of our campuses. You know who you are. You can identify with the story I just shared. You're running from God. You're running. Hoping it's going to help. Hope, hoping it's going to lead to joy or happiness or security or whatever it is you're looking for. I just got a question for you. How's that working out? Because most people I talk to would say, it ain't working out too well. Just want you to know that regardless of what you've called God, what you've thought about God, what you've said to God, his arms are open wide and he's saying, I want you to come home. If you're running away from me, I want you to run to me. I'll forgive you, I'll cleanse you of your sin, past, present, and future. You're like, well, I see, I would, I would but I've, I've already run so far away, I've done all these things, God hates me, I can't even believe this, well, that I've done. 
tell yourself that. It's a lie. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to come home. Stop running from him. Run to him. Some of you have never even run to him for the first time for salvation. To make it to heaven. You've thought, hey, I'm going to get to heaven on my own. I'm going to save myself. I'm going to be a good person. I'm try to go to church on occasion. I'm going to read my Bible some and pray some. That's going to get me into heaven. Not according to the Bible. Not according to this. Get you into heaven is... Jesus, putting your trust and faith in him to save you, not you to save you. Some of you today need to run to him and say, Jesus, you be my savior. I'm a bad savior. I can't save myself. I've been trying. I can't. Jesus, would you save me? And he will. He will. You say, but you don't know what I've done. You keep arguing with me. I just want you to hear me say this to you today. He wants you. He wants you regardless of what you've done. He'll accept you as you are as you turn from your sin and commit your life to Jesus. We call that process committing your life to Christ, repenting of your sin, putting your faith in Jesus. He'll forgive you of your sin. You can know for sure you're going to heaven. You begin a relationship with God. Run to him today. If you decide to commit your life to Christ, I hope you'll just check on this connection card. I'm committing my life to Christ. All of our campuses, you can take it to the back in the Next Step Center. I'd love to give you a nice leather Bible, Old and New Testament. It has Isaiah in it. That's pretty awesome, all right? And we'll give you a nice one. You can get your name engraved on it to help you in your journey with Jesus. Now, I wanted to end a little early today and do something kind of different. I sense God saying this to me uh, this week that we should do something like this because after last weekend's message, I got all kinds of emails and comments on Facebook, messages on Facebook from you guys, which I love getting. And I just recognized that there are so many people in our church right now that are suffering. So many people that would say, like I would say for sure this summer, my life's fall. So many people that would say, as a result, I'm afraid. And so what I wanted to do today is just pray over those in our midst at all of our campuses that are struggling. And how we usually do this, if you've been to our prayer meetings, which our prayer meetings are awesome. If you haven't been there, you're definitely missing out. It's my favorite meeting that we have at Experience Life. But we have a Sunday night prayer meeting in Amarillo, a Monday night prayer meeting at our Southwest campus. Uh, prayer meeting on Tuesday night at our downtown campus. And what we'll do, for uh, sometimes for different prayer topics, is we'll have just the people that that topic applies to, we'll have them stand. And it's not weird or awkward, we don't embarrass anybody. But then what happens is a number of people around them just gather around and put a hand on their shoulder, hand on their arm, and then somebody up here on the stage will pray over them. So we're not gonna do that quite yet, but in just a minute, that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask you to stand if, you've, if you're struggling, stand if you're going through a difficult time, stand if you just want some prayer, and we wanna gather around you. Just just break into a prayer meeting and pray over you. Before we do that, though, I also want to tell you about something else. At all of our campuses, we've got prayer teams here at the front, usually during worship at the end. These folks are awesome, all right? They're not up here just to watch you. You're like, oh, that guy's worshiping, that guy's not. I mean, that's not what they're doing, all right? They're not up here just kind of hanging out, just looking pretty up here. They're actually up here to pray with you. You're going through a difficult time. They want to pray with you. You got a job interview this week. They want to pray with you. Something up with your health or something in your family. They want to pray with you. I'm here to pray with people. I was at our downtown campus a few weeks ago and they had prayer teams. I went up and had somebody pray for me for my voice. I mean, I'm just telling you, I could come up with something for somebody to pray for me about every single week. And so after we finish this kind of corporate prayer time in a minute, I want you as our band begins to play, many of you, if something's going on this week or something's up in your life, come up and ask somebody to pray for you. You know how powerful that is? Have somebody pray over you or your family, what you're going through. And I want, I want to see lines in front of these prayer team members of people saying, pray for me, pray for me. I'd get prayer every week or a couple of weeks at the very least if I was you, if we got these people up here willing to pray with you. Uh, so we're going to do that in all of our campuses here after we finish this prayer time. Let me go back to the other topic. At all of our campuses right now, if you're struggling, feel like your life's falling apart, you're suffering. This would have been me this summer. I would have stood for prayer, I guarantee you. If that's you today, maybe you're afraid. At all of our campuses, we want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask you just to stand up right where you're at at all of our campuses if you're struggling and let us pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird or anything. I'm just going to pray for you. All of our campuses, stand up if you're struggling right now, if you're going through a difficult time. All of our campuses, I know there's more of you than that. Say, we're, again, we're not going to embarrass you. Just admit it. Hey, I need somebody to pray for me. I'm going through a difficult time. People are standing up at all of our campuses. Here's what I want to do. 
look around you. If you're in front of somebody, behind somebody, beside somebody, I want you to stand up with them, and I just want you to reach out a hand and touch their shoulder or touch their arm. We're not touching people's head. Don't put your hand on their head or in their eyes or something like that. All right, just on their arm. If you can't get close to them, all of our campuses, just reach out a hand like this towards somebody that you're close to. Reach out a hand like this, and we're just going to pray over these folks this weekend that are in a place all of us have been at least at one point in time in our life, and that is just struggling, going through a difficult time. Make sure everybody's prayed over at all of our campuses. Make sure everybody has people around them. I just want to pray God's promises over them right now. God, we just call out to you because you're a God who loves it when your people pray. Prayer is so powerful, and you love to answer prayer. And God, we care about those among us right now at all of our campuses that are struggling. We care. We care about what they're going through because we've all been through difficult times where we've suffered or felt like our lives were falling apart. And so God, just like you promised, just like we talked about today, I pray that you'd be with them as you're in them because they put their faith in Christ. God, would you just, would they just feel your presence so powerfully upon them right now, even as people have their hands stretched out and are praying over them. God, let them just feel and sense that you really are with them, that you really do keep that promise. Last weekend, God, we learned that you said you'd never fail us. And so, God, I pray that you would just assure all of these people right now that you're not going to fail them, that you're here for them, that you're going to do something awesome in their lives through this difficult time. God, you promised us when we're suffering that you would comfort us. So, God, I pray that they would sense your comfort over them right now as well. God, would you draw them near? during this time. I pray they'd be, feel like they're closer to Jesus during this difficult time than they've ever been before so they could look back and say it was very difficult but I'm very glad because look at what God did in my life as a result. God, we pray for your intervention that you'd show up, move in power in their lives. And God, we just all look forward to seeing what you're going to do because we believe you've heard our prayers and you're a God who loves to answer prayer and you're a God who keeps his promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.